Hey, my name is Sean Booth. I'm the pastor here at Open Arms Church. We're so glad that you've clicked on this video. Uh, you know, our mission is to see people experience life change through Jesus Christ. And so I, I really pray that this inspires you. It encourages you that you enjoy. Hey, we'd love for you just to, to like and subscribe. That helps us to get the word out. But I really hope that this blesses you today. Enjoy. Good morning, Open Arms. Really excited to be able to speak to you today from our brand new building. It has been so exciting the recent months being able to move in here for our offices and getting ready for the plans of converting everything. I just want to show you a little bit about what we're going to do. As you can see in this, this large room, what we're going to be doing is we're going to firstly going to be building a stairs that will lead up to a second floor and upstairs where it will extend into our current offices. We're going to have all massive space for kids church, for junior kids, for senior kids. And the really exciting thing is that it's going to lead into our gallery. So we're going to have a large auditorium, a theater style, 300 seats downstairs and 100 seats upstairs in our tiered seating gallery. So it's really exciting just to be able to envision and see all the, uh, the preparation and the plans and what is going to be. And I just love for you to pray for us this summer as we get ready for our change of use application or our fire certs as we get ready then to begin construction uh, September, early October. And we're really praying that it's gonna be smooth as it has been thus far. And just to pray for us in every area for favor, for the details, not missing any of them, and all of the provision as God has already provided miraculously our prayer is God continues to do what you're doing. So pray for us in this journey and we're going to be sharing a lot more in September. Be able to share with you 3D drawings and videos that conceptualize what it's going to look like, feel like. And we're also going to do tours to be able to bring people through the building and show you exactly, be able to step in the space and to get a feel of what our church building is going to be like in this next season. So right now, it's July. It is the middle of the year. The evenings are longer, the days are brighter, even sunnier as it has been recently. And, and it's an opportunity for all of us just to catch our breath, just to be able to enjoy this time, this period. And as I've been thinking about it, as much as this time of year can, can be enjoyable, but as we look back at the previous six months, January to June, and we look forward at these next six months, July to December, and we begin to think about getting ready for this next season while also recovering from the season that has been. And it can be really difficult to find peace and calm in the midst of all of our busyness, our responsibilities, our pressures, the difficulties, the problems, all the things that all of us go through in every facet and area of our life. And it can be difficult in this time when your mind is racing and running with negative thoughts, with irrational worries, with anxiety or adrenaline that's running through your veins and, and, and it can consume your mind. I don't know about you, but it's anyone feel this way like myself? Do you, do you feel kind of in that in a moment where you you pause in this summer season to to gather yourself to to get going again and maybe maybe right now you feel yourself worrying about something that can seem normal or even somewhat insignificant to someone else but to you this weight this burden that you're carrying it's it's pressuring it, it's it's burdensome it's wearisome maybe because of what you've just maybe heard on the news, maybe not just in Ireland, but globally, or, or what you've heard uh, from news of a loved one and what they're going through and the problem or the journey that they're going through, or maybe you're worrying about your marriage, fighting for your marriage, wondering, is it going to work? Are we going to get through this time? Maybe you've got more bills to pay than you have money to be able to cover them. Maybe you're, you're making a decision about the future to come or direction to take or maybe whatever it is that you've got on as small as, as it may be or as at large as it can be but the small can often feel like a, a large and big it can be so easy for our minds to be consumed to be overwhelmed with real feelings of worry anxiety and fear 
the Apostle Paul wrote these words in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 9, talking about this very subject. Listen to what he says in verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. Well, the question we have is then what do I do with this energy, with this worry, with, with my mind, my thinking? He says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, in other words, if anything that is going good in your life or you've got something to be thankful for grateful for because we're all you know consumed and focused on all the things that are going wrong if there's anything in your life be focused on those things think about such things and the God of peace will be with you that is a promise from God the God of peace will be with you I want to speak to you for a few moments in the title finding peace for your anxious mind finding peace for your anxious mind my prayer for you if if you've got any sense of anxiety whether that is subconscious where it's causing that the adrenaline coursing through your veins or whether it's like prevalent in the in the forefront of your mind i'm praying for you that you will find peace for your anxious mind that you will find rest you will find calm you will find a lightness for your day to day for your week, for your month, for your season, for this year to come. You know, each of us have in our brain something called the amygdala. The amygdala is the a small peanut-shaped portion of our brain, and it's the part of our brain that's wired for survival. That's what it's wired for. That's what it has been created and formed within our brains to do. It's if you ever find yourself in a moment where you feel like I need to fight. Or, or I need a flight, I need to get out of here. What's happening is, is your amygdala is becoming actively engaged. It's a time where you feel in danger. It's a small portion of your brain, the amygdala kicks in and what it does is it sends strong doses of adrenaline through your entire body and it sends the message, be aware, be alert, be on guard. Danger is in the vicinity, you need to be alert. You need to wake up. If you're driving, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, you're driving on the road and you're just sauntering along and you're driving and all of a sudden in, your, in, in, in the, 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 the vision beside you, you see this, this car is veering into you. What do you do? Straight away, like you, you, you wake up and rather than going in, you go away from the veer and immediately your amygdala kicks in, the adrenaline courses through your, your, your body and it says you, you need to be aware. You need to be alert. You need to be on guard. Maybe if you had this experience where your alarm or a alarm goes off in the middle of the night, you're in a deep slumber and you wake up immediately. And you're like, someone's in the house. I, I gotta get up. And I don't know if you go, if you're like me, you go for the baseball bat that you got ready in the wardrobe. And you're like, someone's in the house. I need to get ready. I need to fight. I need to be alert. It's the amygdala sending that message to your brain. If, if you're ever in a heated debate or you're confronted by somebody or you're walking through conflict and what happens is the adrenaline, the heat rises up in your body and the amygdala fires up and it causes you to do one of three responses fight flight or freeze i'm gonna fight like i'm gonna lean in today so i'm gonna fight i'm gonna get out of here or i'm gonna freeze and i don't know what to do here's what is amazing god gave us this portion of our brain and he gave it to us for a purpose. The problem is that the amygdala is not objective. That means that it's, it's hardwired to protect and it's very easily triggered. I'll, I'll give you an example because oftentimes uh, with the adrenaline or the anxiety that we're experiencing is tied to a previous experience, particularly tied to a trauma that can be easily triggered or a conflict or a confrontation or an experience that has damaged us or, or set within us a memory that continuously keeps coming back up and we put ourselves back into the shoes of what we once were. For me personally, you know, I once had a fight with a loose metal bar of an attic stairs and I lost. I lost big time and it's 
sounds silly, but what happened was um, upstairs in my two-story house was putting a putting a, a mattress upstairs, and I was at the top and very, you know, trying to push it and push it and push it with my dad. It, it slowly loosened the metal par bar that was keeping the styra. It loosened, it went back, and it just hit me on the top of the head, piercing artery, it knocked me straight out cold. I had to get rushed to the hospital. I was rushed in to uh, to the hospital and thankfully didn't suffer any brain damage. Of course, this is where I insert the joke. They struggled to find a brain, but that's a whole other story. But what did happen was I, I was concussed, severely concussed for, for almost two months. And for the next few weeks, as you can imagine, having to, to lie up in bed upstairs, and any time going downstairs to the kitchen or to the living room, every time I walked under the attic and under the attic stairs, what happened within me is, is panic setting. The adrenaline and the cortisol running through my veins began to just run rampant, the amygdala kicked in, and, and for me what happened in this state is what I experienced the freeze. I, I froze. And this, it was like I was brought back to that moment, to that trauma. And even when I talked about it or I shared the story within the, that two month period, and particularly within the first few weeks, it was like I was experiencing it all over again. It was like I was very there. I always say that the recovery uh, and the adrenaline was far more difficult to go through than the actual impact and the trauma itself. And that's why our amygdala, for all of us who go through these times in our life, whether it was something physical or emotional or, or mental, we, our, our amygdala needs help from another part of our brain that's called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the logical part of our brain. It's the, it's the part that tends to think logically. I'll give you an example. You know, that noise that we hear at night or the alarm that goes off and the amygdala screams, you're going to die. You know, get up, run, you're going to die. But the prefrontal cortex kicks in and it brings logic. It says, no, that was probably the wind or it was the cat downstairs or it was the door slamming. And it, it tells you it's going to be okay. There's a, there's a logical reason for this happening. For me, I had to have trauma counseling where I had to regulate my heart rate, uh, the adrenaline, the cortisol level, and be able to process and talk about what I had gone through. And thankfully now, today, I can go up and down that attic stairs and I never think about it. It, it never brings up any anxiety. I've never go back. That trauma has been resolved. That experience has been resolved because I had to allow the prefrontal cortex to, to overcome the amygdala in my brain and rewire my brain, renew my brain through help, through difficult process that has taken years. And now I can approach it thinking logically. The amygdala is all panic, but the prefrontal cortex is all logical. And the problem with the amygdala is it always responds according to the pre-programming of our brain, either by our experience, our belief systems, our fears, our worries, and our concerns. In other words, if you had my experience, you could live the rest of your life thinking that all attic stairs have been created by the devil and they're out to kill us. You know, that could be my reality. That could be my truth. That could be my belief. Or I could process it, which I had to with a trained and professional counselor and come to a logical conclusion. It was an accident. It was an accident. I'm blessed to be alive. <laughs> I'm thankful that I'm not living with any long lasting effects. And you know what? Next time I'm going to be more careful. Is it going to make me fearful? No, it was an accident. It was a freak accident. It's okay. And for all of us, we need to approach life in a healthy way and able to set the past behind and say, that was a difficult time. That should not have happened. That was an accident. Or, or that was something that I did that, you know what, next time I'm not going to do again. I, I want to ask you a question just as you think about your own mind, your own life. What has been an experience that causes, even now, causes the amygdala to flare up, the adrenaline to rush through your, your veins, causing panic, worry, or anxiety? Maybe it's been a past hurt caused by someone. Maybe it's been a fear originating from an experience, even deep into your childhood. Maybe it's a trauma that you endured. 
And now what, what happens is you meet certain people or you enter into certain places or you go through certain events or, or birthdays or anniversaries, whatever it is, or, or some type of news that you hear. It triggers these feelings of anxiety, fear, and tension. Without knowing it, your mind begins to run, it begins to race, the thoughts begin to become triggered, the panic rises up within you and you find yourself maybe short of breath, panicking, wondering, what's going on with me? What, what's wrong with me? And you're trying to control things, you try and control your runaway mind, your runaway thoughts, and with all this in mind, what has this got to do with the Bible and our spiritual lives? Well, because we need to understand that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made, that God has designed us intricately, delicately, that we need to understand our brain as much as we understand the Bible. And we need to understand, as Paul says, in this instance, Philippians 4 verse 6, don't be anxious about anything. This could be something that's coming up, an upcoming exam or job or interview or your health situation or a financial problem that you're coming against or maybe a, a, a future decision that you need to make or or God's provision and will he provide he says don't be anxious about anything but in every single situation no matter how small it is or how large it is in other words if it's on your mind it's on God's heart I love that if it's on your mind it's on God's heart he cares about you more than you can imagine in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving what do we do present your requests to god bring it to god bring it to him and when you give your burdens to god scripture says the peace of god which transcends all our understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus his peace will guard your mind the peace of God will guard your mind in Christ Jesus. How do we receive this peace? Well, it says, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. We need to understand the prayer is powerful. We need to understand the one who we're praying to is the most powerful one. We're praying to the God who can move mountains, the God who can raise the dead, the God who can heal the sick, the God who can make way, who can provide for us, the God who brings the lost home to be found. We need to realize that prayer is always powerful. Here's what's interesting. Prayer doesn't just move the heart of God. Prayer also changes the chemistry in your brain. Prayer changes the chemistry in your brain. For decades, neurologists believe that your brain didn't change after adolescence. How many of you are so grateful that our brain changed after adolescence? I do not know or want to think about how I could still be living as a 35 year old with an 18 year old brain because I would not be making some very wise decisions. But now we know that our brain continues to evolve it continues to change and continues to rewire itself. In fact, the term is called neuroplasticity. It means that the brain is constantly evolving and rewiring itself. And there's a new movement where science and scripture are coming together. And neurologists are discovering that everything that scripture tells us to do for the benefit of our mind is true. Fascinating. It's incredible. It's phenomenal that what the Holy Spirit breathed scripture into Paul to write down on paper 2,000 years ago. That we're, we're only catching up with scripture today. Science is catching up with scripture to believe that what God said through his Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul is true. And this new movement is called Neurotheology. It's the study of the mind and of God. It's also known as spiritual neuroscience. What neurotheology does, it is it studies the relationship between the brain and our belief in God. The brain and our belief in God. Here's one fascinating discovery. Research has shown that prayer actually changes your brain. Not just your thoughts, prayer changes 
your brain. There's an incredible neuroscientist called Dr. Caroline Leaf, an incredible podcast that you should listen to. And she's a Christian who teaches about biblical principles and science and how we can learn and grow from both. And, and she wrote a book called Switch On Your Brain that talks about everything that we're talking about today. And I really encourage you to, to purchase it, to get it if you really need help in this area. And she says a powerful quote about the brain and prayer. She says this, it's been found that just 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight week period can change to brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Fascinating. Not only does prayer touch the heart of God, prayer changes the brain. Just as negative and toxic thoughts harms your brain, prayer can heal your brain. It transforms your brain. It literally, literally, physically renews your mind. So why do we worry about this? Why do we feel and experience and find ourselves so anxious? For followers of Jesus, we should completely trust in God with all of our lives. Why is it that our minds are consumed with and think on and, 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 and completely obsessed by worry in such an irrational way? Well, science tells us that what we're experiencing in these moments is we're experiencing an amygdala hijack. It's where the amygdala kicks in and it takes over our brain. And our little amygdala, is, is, as I said already, it's wired to send the message to protect yourself, to control yourself, to control your thoughts, control your worries, control your anxieties, and says that you better stay up all night because you, if you don't think about this and solve this, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to destroy your life. So science says that we're experiencing an amygdala hijack. Scripture says, that our mind is dominated by sinful thinking. In fact, a definition of worry can be this, that worry is choosing not to trust in the promises and the power of God. Worry is essentially saying, God, I don't trust you. I don't believe in your goodness about this situation. I don't believe that you care about me as much as I care about me. God, I don't believe that you're going to be able to provide for me. I don't believe that you're going to be able to heal me. I don't believe that you're going to be able to make a way, make a miracle, provide for me. I I'm going to worry about this because ultimately, I don't trust in you. Now, that's harsh. You know, that, that can come across like, no, no, we don't think that at all. But in a way, really, truthfully, when you get to the essence of it and to the bottom of it, that's what worry is. Worry is choosing not to trust in God. So instead of letting our sinful nature control our minds, which is what easily happens to each and every one of us, what I need to do as a follower of Jesus, and what I need to do is I need to choose to let my spirit, to the Holy Spirit living and active within me, let the Holy Spirit to direct my thinking. Instead of allowing the sinful nature to dominate and control my mind. Instead, now I need to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to direct my thoughts, to, to do, that dwells within me to direct my thoughts and my thinking. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let the logical part of my brain choose that which is spiritual. I'm going to choose to, to take my prefrontal cortex to think on, to fix on the thoughts on which Philippians 4 verse 8 says to do what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. I'm going to think about such things that are excellent and worthy of praise. The Apostle Paul also wrote in Romans 8, 5, and 6, he says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, what happens? You think about sinful things. Your mind is dominated by the opposite of the things of God and trusting in Him at all times. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that pleases the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. How many of us can say, Amen? It does not lead to a, to a positive ending. It leads to death, destruction, more worry, more anxiety, more fear. But letting the Spirit control your minds leads to life and peace. That's why it's so important, as 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, we demolish, we take apart, we, we destroy arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
So from a scientific standpoint, we're going to let our prefrontal cortex take control of our amygdala by not allowing it to run rampant. But from a spiritual and a scriptural standpoint, we're going to take our thoughts captive and we're going to declare instead of it choosing to allow these irrational thoughts these sinful thoughts to dominate to control my mind i'm going to choose to give it to god i'm going to choose to trust in him even when my irrational fears start to run wildly i'm going to stop i'm going to grab that thought I'm going to make it obedient to Christ. I'm going to surrender to God. I'm not going to allow my sinful, fearful, and dishonoring nature to run my mind in the nature of sin and in the wrong direction. I'm choosing intentionally to let the Holy Spirit to direct my thoughts. And I want to encourage you today. We all worry. Every single one of us. No matter how more spiritual we may think we are or mature or experienced we all worry every one of us you are not alone you're not on your own we all worry we worry about our children about our finances about our future about our education about our workplace we worry about our marriage we worry about you know i worry about my wife i worry about providing for her i worry about with our four boys you know is she doing okay or is she want to run away i worry about my four boys i worry about you know it's hard enough to keep them alive let alone worry about what they're going to end up at and worry about, about me as a father am i doing enough i worry about my church I worry about you know is it going to be okay I worry about why will I preach am I going to say something that's completely controversial am I going to say enough say it too much so what am I I I worry we all worry I want you to hear what I'm saying and not hear what I'm not saying I'm not saying that you are a sinner if you worry that's, that is not in any way the interpretation of the scripture or of the sermon. But once we allow our worry to dominate our lives, to dominate our thinking, to dominate our minds, more than we allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives, we are not living, thinking, or believing, and trusting according to the word of God. We're not. It's the truth. It's the reality. So what do we do when we're worried and anxious about something? Well, 1 Peter 5 or 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Give it to him. Identify. Be aware. I'm anxious, man. I'm feeling anxious. I got anxious thoughts. I'm consumed with with fear, with worry, with irrational thinking. So therefore, I'm going to come to Jesus Christ. I'm going to surrender to him. I'm going to cast all my anxiety on him. I'm going to bring it to him. I'm going to give him my burdens. And this means taking everything, surrendering to him. And when you cast your anxiety to God, you can be be confident that he cares for you. That he'll take it from you. That he'll give you the strength, the power, the, the ability through his Holy Spirit to know he's got this. He's got it. He'll make a way. He'll provide for you. And were you able to say, God, I'm giving this to you. I trust you with my worry. Even if you take it a step further and say, I'm not just giving you my worries. I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you all of me. I'm giving you my brain as much as I'm giving you my heart. I want the peace of God that transcends all understanding to guard my heart and guard my mind. My whole life belongs to you. One really helpful thing, thought as I, as I finish this and bring it to a conclusion that I always remind myself when I come to a place of worry. And in this last six months, I'm telling you what, I've come to a lot of places of worry. One thing and principle that, that I live by is bringing myself from recentering myself to this place and saying this statement. I'm going to do the, all that I can do. And I'm going to trust that God will do what only he can do. Right now, I want to give you something very practical three very small simple steps decisions that you can make today right now you can make it a hundred times a day bringing your mind back firstly choose i'm going to do what i can do i'm going to do what's in my ability i'm going to maximize my effort my discipline in other words if you've got an exam or a project or a deadline or or a decision that's coming up you're not just trusting god for it you're not gonna say god's got this no you're, you, what are you going to do? You're going to study. You're going to work hard. You're going to be disciplined. You're going to be devoted. 
you're, you're going to do everything that you can do. If you want to get in better shape, if you, you're not just then praying, God, I pray that you'll make me healthy. No, you're going to eat right and exercise. You're going to get good advice. You're going to do what you can do. If you're walking through emotional trauma or physical trauma, as I went through, what are you going to do? I'm going to seek wise counsel. I'm going to do everything with my ability. I'm going to read the word of God daily. I'm going to pray daily. Just 12 minutes a day for eight weeks can change your brain to such a point that you can see it on a brain scan. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to do what I can do. Here's secondly, I'm choosing, I'm going to give God what I can't do. If I can't do something, I'm going to trust it to God. I'm going to trust to give God what I can't do. Firstly, I'm going to do what only I can do. Secondly, I'm going to trust God what only He can do. And finally, I'm going to trust God no matter what. When I give it away, when I cast my anxiety to Him on my problems and my burdens and my worries and my concerns and my fears, I can't take it back. I'm going to trust God no matter what. Oh, what's going to happen? What way is this going to end up? Do you think it'll come through? I don't know. But I've trusted God with it. And I trust that he'll make a way. Or I trust that he'll make the right decision. And if it ends up where it's the decision or the conclusion that was not my preference, I'm going to believe and trust that God has a purpose to this. And that he's going to turn all things together for his good. My testimony of these last 12 months it has not been my preference to walk through this last 12, 15 months the way that we have. But you know what I've continued to do? I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to give God what I can't do and what only He can do. I'm going to trust God no matter what. You know what? I'm st sitting here today in a building that has paid off getting ready to convert it, uh, speaking to a church that is vibrant and is growing, speaking to our church in Newbridge and Kildare, that it is an absolute miracle, a testimony that I celebrate. I say, wow, God, I'm so grateful that I trusted you because you are worthy of my trust. I'm so grateful that I cast all my anxiety on you. I'm so grateful that you are the head of this church. I'm so grateful that you are the true leader that I can look to in my, in my church, my home, my family, and my mind. And guess what? I've experienced the peace of God that transcends all understanding, that has guarded my heart, that has guarded my mind. And I want to encourage you, you can do the same. Do what only you can do. Give God what you can't do and trust that He will do what is right. Come on, right now, would you just close your eyes and bow your heads with me? Think about right now what you need to give God and trust in Him no matter what. What do you need to say, God, I'm trusting you with this. I know your goodness, your mercy. It follows me all the days of my life. And I believe that you'll be able to provide. As you think about that, as you rises within you, maybe as your amygdala begins to flare up and Sends the panic and anxiety and the question is, but what if he doesn't? Or what if he can't? Or what if he won't? I want to encourage you, he will. He will. Trust that he will. Maybe you've been living your life in such a way that it's been consumed by what if. What if he doesn't? Why don't you turn in another direction and believe, but what if he does? Right now, with everyone's head bowed and eyes closed, I want to pray with you and pray for you and give you an opportunity to enter into a relationship with Jesus, to renew your relationship with Jesus, or just to take a moment to surrender everything to Him, to lay it as a feet. And pray with me these words in your heart, silently, deeply, and just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my worry. I give you my anxiety. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and think on what is true. In all that I do, I'll do what I can do. I'll trust you with what I can't do. And I'm going to trust you no matter what. I give you all my life, all my worries, all my anxiety, and I thank you for your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.